I have to apologize with you because I'm stupid. There will not be the usual video today in the usual documentary format, and it is all because <laughs> I have been stupid. Let's tell you what happened. You may have noticed that what was supposed to be the video for last week, rather than being published on Sunday, it has been published on Tuesday. The reason for that was problems that I had with the sponsor uh, that you haven't seen exactly because there were problems, but this caused a delay. Furthermore, at the beginning of the week, I also had some, let's say, personal commitments that I couldn't skip, so I couldn't work for some time. So I had fewer days to prepare the usual video, and my plan for this week was discussing the type of weapons that Western Air Forces, let's say NATO Air Forces, are going to use in the future for the suppression of air defenses or destruction of air defenses. Last week's video was about air superiority, of which overcoming the opponent's air defenses is a big part, as I explained last week. That video was inspired by an article that appeared on an Italian defense magazine. And in the same article, there was also an interesting part dedicated to the weapons that Western Air Forces could be using in the near future to acquire air superiority. The article was talking about three main weapons, the Stormbreaker, the Spear, and the AGM-88 ER. Okay. These are very, very interesting because the old paradigm, the anti-radiation missile, was a missile that locked on the radar emissions and used them to attack the radar. And if the radar stopped emitting, then the missile was capable of more or less reaching the same spot, but the accuracy was much diminished. This is the reason why the harm has had some effectiveness in Ukraine, uh, but it was not really overwhelming. And in a modern environment with ground-based air defenses that have increasing ranges. I mean, the medium range today is not the medium range in the 70s. <laughs> it's twice as much. Every weapon that should be considered for uh, SEAD or DEAD campaigns uh, should be a long-range weapon. But today there is another complexity, which is the fact that short-range air defenses, the so-called SHORADs, are actually capable of intercepting this kind of projectiles directed against maybe more valuable or more long-range systems. And as for under the battery fully deployed, should, in theory, be protected by a number of Panzer systems, which have exactly the purpose of engaging the incoming weapons. So any weapon that you use for a Sidradid campaign must be either capable of penetrating this kind of multi-layer defense or be capable of saturating this kind of defenses. All this seemed very interesting to me. And in fact, in the West, we have the two approaches. The AGM-88 E ARGM has the same number as the Legacy Harm, but it is basically a completely different weapon. It is faster, it is longer ranged, and even the Seeker is different from the latest variants of. In fact, this weapon is supposed to have a multispectral Seeker, which is obviously capable of tracking the radar emissions, is obviously capable of maintaining the course when these emissions disappear, but is also capable of acquiring a target, discriminating it against the background to attack, for example, the radar of surface-to-air battery. And the fact that it's capable of reaching a over Mach 2 in the final dive makes it a very difficult target for the shorts that are protecting the more valuable assets. This is one type of philosophy, but there's also another one. 
This is the type of philosophy of the Stormbreaker or the European Spear system. These are small. The Stormbreaker is uh, about 120 kilos. The, the, the Spear is about 90 kilos. That have a range of about 70, 80 kilometers, which is far enough to guarantee a relative safety from anything other than the most long range air defenses. They are connected with the launcher or by, with any other asset by data links. The Stormbreaker is a Link 16 terminal. The Spear has its own proprietary data link. And they are characterizing of having a multispectral seeker. They have a microwave radar, they have an infrared seeker, and they can also be guided by laser designation uh, in case you need pinpoint precision, which is generally not applicable uh, against air defenses. These weapons are on the light side of the equation, but they are small. They can be carried in relatively large numbers. For example, an F-35 can carry up to eight Stormbreaker within the base, and even more if you use the external pylons, giving up stealth. They are relatively cheap. For example, the Stormbreaker has a non-cooled infrared seeker, which is way, way cheaper than what uh, is used in many other similar weapons. So they can be launched and uh, used in uh, numbers high enough to saturate the defenses of the big surface-to-air batteries. They're quite on the light side, but I mean, surface to air defenses, either launchers or radars or common vehicles, are not that difficult targets. They are pretty soft. So even a relatively small warhead that is decently precise can put them out of order. So all of this seems quite interesting to me, so I decided to dedicate a video. But after doing some additional research and preparing uh, a good portion of the script, I remember that I didn't check the popularity of this subject with YouTube. In fact, now YouTube is giving you a tool where you can actually research how popular or better they use a different metric. They claim that they can calculate the interest of uh, the, the typical viewers. And... Uh, so I actually checked it and I realized that pretty much it appears that I'm the only one who is interested. So I thought that was probably not worth making an entire video about this. This subject could be maybe integrated in a video that has a broader uh, reach that is speaking of uh, something related, uh, but probably was not worth dedicating an entire video to this. And obviously, I realized this, I made this, <laughs> made this basic research only on Friday night. So, yep, a change of tack was on order. So there was another interesting subject that I didn't include in the plan for December, but I had already done some research, which was upgrades to the J-20. You know that J-20 this year has seen uh, a number of uh, novelties. We have seen the J-20A, we have seen the Twin Seater, but um, also uh, in, in the context of the presentation of the aircraft in static exposition at the Changchun Air Show, there have been some interviews, declarations and so on. So the, we have had some explanation on how the aerodynamic of the aircraft works. And it is quite interesting because it is a system that manages six vortices um, altogether. It's... The Chinese claim that it was a world first. I'm not entirely sure, but it's surely very, very original. There was the first emission that the J-20 actually features collaborative targeting. It's not clear if it is a feature of the J-20A, it's possible, or it is a feature that already existed in the older aircraft, but now at least at declaration level, we know that it does so. There have been some analyses that show how the aircraft 
from the front is probably less stealthy than F-22, F-35s, but, uh, but this is quite a slippery slope because stealth is something that has a, a very quick diminishing return with the decrease in the radar cross section. So this is probably not so important, but apparently the aircraft has been optimized to be stealth from the side. From the back is probably crap. It's not really stealthy, but from the side could be very stealthy and probably even better than the F-22 or the F-35. And uh, if you think about it, you will notice that the aircraft is quite squat. So the lateral section in relation to the aircraft volume is quite low. And this is obviously, and this is just an important element for reducing the lateral radar cross section. But the point is, why would that be important? Well, it's because the J-20 has side-looking radars. So a J-20 can launch a PL-15 and then turn the defense and then turn defensive and still have the radars uh, tracking the target, assisting the missile and so on. The F-22 that launches an AMRAM at long range still needs to go roughly towards the target because if it launches an AMRAM at long range till the AMRAM seeker goes live, the AMRAM must be uh, assisted and guided via data link uh, with the help of the aircraft radar. So if this analysis is true, then the J-20 may end up presenting the side to the opponent more often than the American aircraft. Thus, stealth from the side becomes quite important. And another piece of interesting news that appeared about the J-20 is the fact that the Chinese are developing an electronic warfare uh, suite based on the large language model technology that powers the AI that everybody knows, that powers ChatGPT, uh, Grok, and what else. What's the advantage? Well, electronic warfare systems depend on libraries in the sense that to identify and neutralize a threat, you need to have a library that tells the system what the threat is, and there is a mechanism that classifies the any signal, any track, any incoming radiation, and try to associate that to a specific threat to, yeah, understand if it is a real threat or if it is necessary to uh, jam it or do something. An artificial intelligence system could be capable of doing the same job without fully detailed libraries because this is what these systems do. They look for patterns and they can take a decision even based on, let's say, incomplete data. Furthermore, they should be able to recognize uh, by analogy unknown threats that have never seen before. It is uh, absolutely normal that uh, aircraft radars or uh, communication systems or ground-based radars don't use some emission modes or communication modes during peacetime just to yeah keep them secret. Don't allow an eventual opponent to study them and add them to their libraries. With an artificial intelligence-based electronic warfare system, it would be much easier to identify these unknowns. At least this is the theory and the Chinese are not the only ones working on this, but they are the first that say that they are going to pursue this type of systems and they're going to deploy them on the J-20. So it seemed to me another interesting subject. I very quickly draw a script, not a full script as I usually do, but a script with just by point. I recorded it, I started editing, and when I started editing, I actually realized that it was terrible. Terrible in the sense that I made so many grammar errors, so many 
pronunciation mistakes that I had to keep adding small corrections here and there. So, you know, when the when there is some text that appears in the video correcting what I say, you know. But there was probably one every 20 seconds. So it was unusable. And basically I realized this this morning at six o'clock. There were too many errors. It was unpublishable. Well, I suppose that this is a good subject for a video because, I mean, because I know that even without YouTube telling me that you are interested in the Chinese developments, so this could be a good subject. But yeah, there's no time to redo it. So I just went out, I had a walk, and I recorded this. To apologize with you, the normal schedule will resume next Sunday if I'm not an idiot again. So thank you very much for watching and see you next time.